great. I think we can open it up for uh, group discussion. Uh, and then maybe just to kick things off, I actually had a question for uh, Robert, actually based on his, and we had a little sidebar on this um, in terms of um, uh, control groups in a randomized uh, study and so forth. Uh, he presented some nice examples of how Caesar has been carrying this out in general, uh, about four different sites and so forth. But I wanted to hear um, your thoughts uh, about how to think about this in terms of cancer sequencing, in terms of um, including control arms, and uh, in some cases, I think, considering some of the ethical issues of potentially not returning a potentially actionable result uh, in those patient groups. Well, I, I think I'll dodge that question because I'm not a cancer expert, and I think part of the excitement of a CSER II would be to try to cre create some creative solutions to that sort of thing. But I will say that, you know, I, I think that in cancer and in other conditions, you have a lot of flexibility about the way you design clinical trials. You can design them for time lag. So for example, you can design an intervention in, in a control group. Instead of not having that intervention, you could have it later on in time. You can design different dosages of a particular intervention. So for example, instead of a, uh, I don't know, a, a drug that's tailored to a particular cancer, you can give one that's a little bit tailored and one that's even more tailored. So there's a lot of creativity in the way that you can, I think, accrue health evidence that would be part of the challenge to investigators, in my mind, in, in a CSER two. Levi? So I wanted to ask about a topic that um, Robert touched on in his talk, and also uh, Gail touched on in her talk, but we haven't actually expressly discussed it. And this is the issue of, so Robert, you were pointing out that one of the ways to approach um, re-phenotyping in the setting of, for example, variable significance is sometimes one could go back and do either deeper phenotyping or even sometimes in a biochemical based phenotyping, et cetera. And, uh, and Gail, in her talk, brought up this idea that there are groups around that are now doing assays and they're functional assays for variants. And so this is something that raises a, a question that one could imagine, you know, emphasizing the the E in Caesar uh, in 2.0, which is that there there are contexts where there are variants of uncertain significance, but they're plausible and you know the, the context is right, but you don't actually know if they're functional. Uh, but there there might be instances where one could, uh, with the right collaboration, the right teams, do kind of a, a very focused functional assessment, either of the variant itself uh, or if there are. Uh, cells or tissues from the individual um, where one could do an additional kind of uh, deeper functional screen. So uh, one, it's sort of an appealing and novel and innovative uh, direction that one could go. I guess maybe this is even a question for NHGRI. Do you guys have the appetite for, uh, for that kind of approach? There's certainly a lot of interest and there are, there's a big space out there when one, where one could explore the idea of more phenotyping, more functionally based phenotyping for variants that are crying out uh, to look like actionable, we, we just don't have the space and we may never, and if we just wait for kind of the clinical experience to grow, there may be a long lag before we um, learn about that. Go ahead. So I, I think it's really, that's a really important idea. Um, we've taken the approach at UVM that if we do research on the clinical variants that we're seeing that we don't know what they do, we're much less, more like, much more likely to feed back clinically useful information with the functional genomics research that's being done there. And so I don't know if there are ways to link the variants that we don't understand through the CSER project to functional genomics parts of NIH um, more broadly even, which also could get us to guidelines that actual clinicians believe in because they'll be the variants that they're seeing in their patients and how to use them. So I think, I mean, some of the CSER sites are doing this in a very limited way, and obviously there's broader interest. Um, my understanding is the UDN program also has a significant functional component as well, but it's, it's something that certainly would be of relevance to CSER going forward, especially in the context of um, the, the, the workflows you already have, it's something to explore. Yeah, and to more broadly answer Levi's question, um, you know, it is something I think we are definitely discussing, and it's going to be part of the function, can I say about the next GM meeting? You know, it's going to be part of actually, we already discussed as a topic for the next GM meeting is how to make connections with functional and functional work. And I think that, you know, I talked before about the virtuous cycle that came out of the discussion with the sequencing, but I think there's another way you can think about the basic research of that virtual cycle 
to also think about things very much at the functional interface. Thank you. Dan? You know, so I'm a huge fan of this because in the Iron Channel world, it's you know the assays are easier than most or than many, but but there's also this sort of limitation in the sense that you do have people who carry variants that are clearly functional at the in vitro level and have no phenotype, and peop and there are and there are also variants that we think clearly confer a phenotype, but the assays that we have unless you sort of start to really drill down or make mice or whatever, you, you really miss the phenotype. So, but I, I, I'm 99.9% I'm, I'm in favor of the idea that, 100% in favor of the idea that, that, that adding, no, no, adding, adding that phenotypic information is a, is, ought to be a helpful way of going forward in terms of interpreting these data, just with the caveat that it's not perfect, but it's, but it's, uh, it would be a huge step forward. And I, I think the Iron Channel should be done first. That <laughs> goes without saying. Um, Heidi? So, I mean, I completely agree that we need more functional analysis. I think the question is how to more, most effectively do it. Because I think one-off encounters with a patient leading to a one-off functional study may, may not be the most efficient nor effective way to do it. And one of the biggest challenges in variant interpretation is interpreting literature on functional analysis, especially when it's been done on one or two variants, limited validation of the actual assay to be a good predictor of, of the actual phenotype, et cetera. So I think one thing to do is to continue to share these variants. There's groups that have functional approaches that if given access to large sets of variants that have actually been observed in patients and the ability to go back to those patients and correlate their functional studies with phenotypes back and forth, I think would be an incredibly rich exchange. And so I think we just have to figure out how to connect groups that are doing more high throughput studies that are well validated assays with the patients and the data that they're coming from. Steven? Steve Joffrey from uh, UPenn, different uh, topic. I want to um, give a shout out to some of the conceptual work that's been done in CSER and, and emphasize the importance of that work in any future uh, work that comes out of this. And specifically what I have in mind, on one of Robert's first slides, you talked about the different senses of clinical utility. You were um, channeling Muir and Curie there. You know, sort of narrow sense, broad sense, and broadest sense. And one of the key questions we have is, so which of those senses should we take into account when we're deciding what to pay for with collective funds, whether they be taxpayer funds or healthcare premium funds? You know, the broadest sense, anything that matters to somebody, you know, do, is that the sort of thing that would sort of imply an obligation to pay for that with collective funds? Where in that spectrum should we be thinking about that? And that's not entirely an empirical question. And so that's just an example of the sort of conceptual work that I think we've been able to do in parallel with the empirical work that has gone on in CSER and I hope we'll be able to do in the future. Uh, Robert, did you want to address that? Yeah, no, I, not that particular, but I just want to say, building off of that, that two of the real key uh, innovations, I think, in CSER has been, in the larger sense, as Steve was pointing out, integrating LC constructively with the implementation work. And you know, this is not LC, this is this is not your father's LC. This is not this is not uh, sort of staking out positions in a way that could be construed to uh, just sort of be slowing down the progress. This has been a real working interactive relationship that uh, iteratively works back and forth between the data and the policy. And the second thing is, Dan, uh, building off of your comment, I think we have the opportunity to really transform the entire notion of phenotyping from an 18th century phenotyping which is you know tapping on the knees and listening to the heart to a 21st or 22nd century phenotyping which is a true systems biology approach to the entire biological spectrum of disease and CSER won't do that by itself or without a ton of help but we could be one of the points of that particular spear So, again, in my laboratory world, um, the reason I'm doing these tests is, is to help with a diagnosis. Um, sometimes it's to confirm a diagnosis, sometimes it's to rule out. Um, but in the clinical utility world, uh, where does the value of the diagnosis come in to place, even if there is no treatment, there is not I mean, I, I don't know how to look at, at outcome studies if there's not really a treatment, but 
to come up and say, here is the diagnosis, therefore we know there's no treatment. Um, you know, at, at what point does that become valuable? And one of the challenges with the genetic diseases is that the outcomes are not always on the patient, but the outcomes are on the family members. So how do you pull that together to demonstrate value? So I think, and we'll hear from, from Matt might after, after uh, lunch, I think, um, and he can give you a, a very personal example, but from the perspective of genetic disease as a practitioner and also from the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, I think we place great value in simply solving the puzzle, because not because solving the puzzle is the end, but that solving the puzzle is the beginning, and it's the beginning of the next search as to uh, learning about the biology of the disease and learning about the biology of the disease takes us directly towards therapy. So I think there's huge value in that and thinking about CESA 2.0 then I think uh, that should in definitely be part of it. And one last comment also, I think maybe someone was whispering it over here, but we do have much more uh, power now with saturation mutagenesis type experiments and CRISPR uh, to do much more high throughput functional studies. Uh, they're not the be all and end all, but we definitely can, that can take us much further in terms of a disease in a dish along with stem cell technologies. And uh, to Robert's point, we, we can measure people at times uh, relatively cheaply in a way that we could not do just a few years ago. So I think that would also be something to, to consider strongly. And I just wanted to follow up on the comment that someone made earlier, and I forgot who it was, I, I apologize. But I'm wondering whether it, it would be useful and interesting to have more emphasis on comparative effectiveness between what we think of as genomic testing and what we think of as the rest of medicine. I mean, it's very surprising, for example, how, what the positive predictive value is of a cholesterol level. It's really nowhere near what people think. Um, and, and I think there are many other things that we routinely do in medicine that are, are as good or worse than what some of the positive predictive value is from genomic. So maybe some comparative effectiveness between genomic and non-genomic medicine would be interesting. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to get back to the phenotype issue and the re-phenotyping. I think we just have to, I, I think in Caesar 2, it will be extremely important to have some baseline <coughs> phenotypes agreed upon in advance of something we didn't do in Caesar 1 because our patient populations are so different. I think if we're going to re-phenotype people, we have to be very careful at the variants we pick. So just from the example that, um, that Robert gave, some of those are incredibly well-documented variants where, frankly, just phenotyping a few more Caesar patients won't be helpful, whereas there are others that are associated with very severe uh, severe inherited diseases where phenotyping those individuals would be very helpful. And so I think there is a process of prioritizing the re-phenotyping that would really maximize our knowledge of Caesar patients and not be redundant with other studies. Katrina. So I guess I was interested in the panel's comments. One of the things that has really appealed to me about Caesar over its history has been I think often as we're seeking to improve medicine, let's say, that we either focus on developing the perfect tool, so we have the perfect test, or we separate that and focus on how are we going to use it in clinical practice. But the reality is, I think as you're suggesting, so much of how good the test needs to be depends upon the clinical decision that we're going to make with it. And so much of this is really an iterative potential process. And I guess I was interested, as you all think about it, you know, maybe even your echo comment, you know, how do we think about maybe the future of CSER is continuing, I think, in one of the few programs to really sit in that interface, recognizing that you are continually trying to make the test or the tool better, but that it's actually understanding the application of that in clinical practice that is critical for us to be able to make that tool better. Because the perfect tool, to be honest, is never going to exist. And we're always going to make trade-offs of where do we need to focus on making the tool better and where are we actually at the point that it can already inform the decision we need to make in clinical practice. So I'd just be interested, I think Robert, both of you and Yun commented on that, but as you look forward, do you see that as an opportunity for CSER? 
Well, I, I mean, I think you, you said it very well. I mean, I think we have to balance the two. And I think actually we've been doing, well, we, you, because we're talking really about Caesar here, so I think the people in the room are not part of Caesar, um, have actually been doing a very good job of that. Uh, I think paying some attention to the technical aspects, improving that, making sure that process is iterative, and then finding new places to apply this to, then testing those and feeding it back. Actually, I see I see that as a as a major success of, of you know as I was reading through the packet and obviously many of the papers I've read and were were aware of the the good works of the consortium. Um, but I think Bob's point is also a really good one, and it sort of reflects the point we made earlier that. I think we can hold ourselves to too high a standard, and that comparing to, to standard tests that are currently used and in practice and accepted by other people will, will make the narrative easier, uh, but I just think is, is more realistic. Can I, can I ask, you, you brought up the broader societal good as a measure of clinical utility versus proving clinical utility at the individual patient level. What, what does this group think? Does this group think that it's worthwhile investing resources on the broader societal clinical utility given the state of our so-called healthcare system? I would just have to say, I, I think we have to be skeptical of the notion of social proofing. There have been an awful lot of ideas that have been socially proofed um, or proven, if you will, that have turned out to <coughs> simply be wrong. And that's where the primacy of evidence has to be maintained. And I, I, I think it's, it's interesting to observe as things get taken up by um, society in general, um, but that doesn't always um, result from a sensible uptake. And five, 10 years later, then the things that were embraced are found to be lacking. Or putting it a different way, and I know I'm going to get ribbed for this later, CSER is the conscience of the biotech tsunami that is coming. 